Hello friends, Pastor Jesse here at Pequay Evangelical Church in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, where we exist to help you know and follow Jesus. One of the ways that you do that is through what you're participating in by watching this video. It's through our weekly studies and dive-ins, our intentional times in God's Word, what you would call Bible studies. Right now we're in the midst, this is the summer of 2024, we're in the midst of a study of all the amazing parables, the stories, the illustrations that Jesus told, the stories, the parables that Jesus used in his teaching ministry while he walked among us and in this series we're seeking to see what they mean what they teach us about him and his kingdom and then what they mean for our lives how we can apply their truths to our daily lives we're coming to the end of the series we're all the way in matthew chapter 18 verses 21 and 35 through the parable that's known widely as the unforgiving servant or the unmerciful servant and tonight I want to thank you to ask you to think back to our last time around God's Word together when we participated in a study of the parable of the talents. If you remember, if you don't remember, you can actually go back and watch that video on our YouTube channel. But if you remember in that parable, the master gives to each of his servants money according to the servant's ability. To two servants, they use the resources well, and the way that they use the resources that the master gives them returns an, an investment or a profit on their investment. One does nothing, however, with the resources that he's given, and thus he returns no profit on the master's investment. The two who use their resources well, they are commended. The one who did not do anything with their resources, however, he is rightfully condemned because he was lazy and lethargic. And if you remember, the point that Jesus was relaying to us as his followers is that to each of us, to each and every one of us, whether we are a believer in this moment or not, to each and every one of us, we are given an opportunity and we are given the ability to make an impact, a profitable impact on the kingdom of God. And when we live lives that, that do this, we are able to share in the master's joy. Remember, that was the centerpiece of our study last time together. We are able to share in the joy of the Lord, and we know that that joy is unmatched and it is without end. Today, though, as we turn to Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 through 35, that's in Matthew 25. Today, we turn to the parable of the unforgiving servant. However, we see the opposite end of the spectrum. We see the same starting principle that through Jesus, we have been given much. In this case, we have been given much in the line of forgiveness. We have been forgiven much. In fact, forgiveness that is unmatched and that is like Jesus' joy without end. But then with that, we have been given the opportunity that Jesus, that God expects us to do something, that God expects us to do much with what we have been given, the opportunity and gift that we have been given. What is it that we are to do with this grandiose amount of forgiveness and mercy that God has bestowed and freely gifted to us? Well, simply... We are to show a grandiose amount of forgiveness and mercy to those who are just like us, in need of a grandiose amount of mercy and forgiveness. And that's the big idea of today's parable of Jesus as for us as believers, as ones following Jesus, as ones experiencing his forgiveness. It's the reminder, it's the pointing out that we have been forgiven much. That we as followers of Jesus Christ, as his redeemed, restored, and beloved children, we have been forgiven and given much. So thus, we should forgive much, right? So let's see that as we look through God's word today. I want us to take this teaching of God's word in three parts. Let's first make sure that we understand the context of this teaching on forgiveness by Jesus. And that context is given to us in verses 21 through 22. Let's read those here. Then Peter came up to Jesus and asked him. He said, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or my sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered him saying, I tell you not seven times, but 70 times seven times. Now, Jesus has just said to this prior to Jesus or to Peter asking this question of Jesus. The stage setting to Peter giving this question is Jesus teaching us about how we should deal with sin in the church, how we should deal with sin amongst brothers and sisters in Christ, believers and followers of Christ, how we are to deal with sin when, when we are sinned against in the church. First, he says to us, address it privately. This is all prior to verse number 21. He says, address sin, address the sin with a brother or sister in Christ privately, one-on-one, -on -one, just between the two of you. 
If that doesn't work, then you are to bring two or three witnesses or two or three fellow believers to address it with the individual who is sinning against you. And if that doesn't work, Jesus says third, then take it to the church. Take it to the larger body of believers and address it with the individual there. And so that's the context. That's what sets up Peter's question and the boldness that it comes to Peter to ask this question. And Peter is thinking along those lines, and he's pondering the same question that generations of, of Jewish believers, generations of people who have pondered, and I'm sure are rolling through Jesus' mind here as they uh, speak about and think about sin amongst believers. And Jesus, Peter asked Jesus the question, how many times should we forgive one another? And Peter, again, with that long library, that long history of Jewish debate about forgiveness, attempts to put a number on forgiveness in his mind. And I think it's fair to say Peter attempts to make himself look good, attempts to make himself look really good, makes him, attempts to make himself look highly merciful and very forgiving by setting his opening number on forgiveness at seven. And anyone who spent any time in the Bible, even outside the Bible, we, we hear this, that the seven is the number that is considered the number of completeness. Seven is the number of perfection. Of course, if we know the Genesis, the, the creation story that God created the world, all the world in seven days. So seven has a great significance both in scripture and in the world. And Peter here is setting the bar very high with his willingness to forgive, setting his forgiveness meter, if you will, at seven, right? It's the number of completeness. It's the number of perfection. But what we see Jesus do in response is he uses a number far greater than seven to actually show that Peter's and Jewish histories and our thinking to this day when it comes to forgiveness, Jesus uses a number in connection to forgiveness to show that we should not place numbers on the ways or the times that we forgive one another. Jesus says in response to Peter, not seven times, but 70 times seven times. In other words, what, what Jesus is really saying, if we could put it into our language, Jesus is saying, don't count how many times you forgive. Don't put a number on forgiveness. Jesus says the attitude and the thinking that our forgiveness should be limited by number and by quantity is the wrong attitude and thinking when it comes to forgiveness. Our forgiveness, especially as and amongst believers, as members of his body and his church. And you may ask yourself, why? Why is limiting? Why is putting a quantity, a number, on forgiveness something that should not exist in the church? Well, because as members of Christ's church, as members of his redeemed, restored body, thanks be to God, Jesus doesn't put any limit, any number on the number of times that he is willing to show us complete, total, and perfect forgiveness. And Jesus makes clear in verses 23 through 30, he makes that clear in verse, these verses by calibrating, by recalibrating our mindset in view of forgiveness through this parable of the unforgiving servant. Hear the word of the Lord, starting in verse 30 with me. Jesus says, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since the man was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before the master, pleading with him, saying, Be patient with me. Be patient with me, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go free. Verse 28, But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed his fellow servant and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe me. His fellow servant, too, fell on his knees and begged him, saying, Be patient with me, and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay back the debt. And when the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged, and they went and told their master everything that they had saw, saw the servant do, everything that had happened. And so in this parable, let's understand the characters. There are four characters. Three are themselves equal. Three of themselves are equals, and they are fellow servants. Equal, on level ground before the king who is over all the servants. Who is represented in these parables? Who are the servants? Who is the king? Really, the, th the, the three characters here. 
We, of course, are represented by the servants. We are uh, amongst, as brothers and sisters and amongst the church, we are representative of Jesus' servants. And, of course, Jesus, God the Father, they are the king, the master of the church. And in this parable, all the servants, the one who is initially forgiven by the king, the one who has forgiveness withheld from the fellow servant, and the servants who are outraged at the first servant withholding forgiveness after it was so freely and fully given to him, Again, we must see and understand and keep in the back of our minds or at the forefront of our minds that they are all on the same level footing. They are all at the same place before the king. And the same is true of us, and that is must be our attitude. That is the only attitude that will allow us to truly practice, truly put into place the without limit and complete forgiveness that Jesus is calling us to here as his people. And let's get into the parable. With that in mind, keep that in mind. The servant one has a massive debt, a debt that he is never going to be able to repay. You see that he owes 10,000 bags of gold when one bag of gold was 20 years worth of wages. There is no way one bag of gold equals 20 years, 20 years of, of wages. There is no way that he is paying that debt back, not even if he was given 20 lifetimes to pay it back. So he does the only thing that he can do, truly the only option and course that he has to take. What he does is he gets on his knees and he pleads his case before the king. He pleads for mercy and forgiveness and patience from the king. And the king, we see he graciously gives it. The master takes away all of the responsibility of the debt. He just wipes it away, cancels it, makes it null and void. Okay, that's what happens between the king and servant one. That exact same servant, servant one, will call him. He His next move is to go out of the king's presence, find a fellow servant, servant two will call him, and make sure that that servant, servant two, who owes servant one a massive debt, make sure that he pays the debt, right? Servant two owes servant one a debt of a hundred silver coins, which we can understand that one silver coin was about a day's wages. So make no mistake, that is a large debt, but it's by no means an impossible debt to pay back. It's not an insurmountable debt like servant one owed the king. And the fellow servant who owes the debt doesn't ask the, the servant to cancel his debt as the king has done for him. Rather, he just asks for patience from his fellow servants, patience to allow him the time that he needs to pay back the debt. And you would certainly think that this servant, after the massive gift and cancellation of debt that he has just given, he would be more than willing to grant this totally responsible and reasonable request. This request, not for the cancellation of the debt, but just for patience and allowing him time to, to pay back the debt but he does not grant those things. He is not patient to him. Instead, he grabs him, he chokes him, and he has him thrown into the debtor's prison. In these days, in Jesus' days, and for many generations up until recent, prison was not a place necessarily for criminals, but for people who owed debt. It was a debtor's prison. And here, as we move to the consequences of this servant's for unforgiveness in verses 31 through 36, we see our fourth character in this parable in the fellow servants, the servants who were witnesses to both the grace of the king and the impatience and unforgiveness of servant one. The fellow servants, knowing all this, they are outraged, knowing that the king has done such a great thing for first servant, yet he's been so callous and unforgiven to serving two. They are outraged and they go to the king and they tell the king all that servant one has done. And the king, at hearing this, he is rightly angry. He is rightly outraged himself. He calls servant Ron into his presence and says to him, you wicked servant, you wicked person. I have canceled such a grand debt for you out of nothing but my mercy, but you have shown zero mercy to your fellow servant who owes you a much smaller debt. In anger, the king has the servant thrown into prison until he pay back the debt, which of course, as we just spoke about, will be never. And so the question is, that's the understanding of the parable. Well, what do we learn and how can we apply this parable? What do we need to make sure that we see and live out in our lives and in the way that we forgive one another, especially in the church? I have a few things. First, we must forgive 
from our hearts. And this will be the root, this will be the basis to forgiving the way Jesus calls us to forgive. Look at verse number 35. When Jesus gives his summary statement on forgiveness, this is what he says. He says, this is how my Father, Heavenly Father, will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the key to forgiveness and Jesus-like attitude to, towards forgiveness. We have to truly forgive from the heart, from the deepest parts of ourselves, rather than faking it till we make it, rather than putting on a, a face of forgiveness, putting on a smile and pretending like everything's all right, all the while inside we are just churning in bitterness and in unforgiveness. Let's just sample a few verses that describe the endless, total, and complete forgiveness of Christ. The Word of God says in 1 John that we've been studying Sunday mornings here, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from our righteousness. Psalm 32 declares, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sins are covered over. Psalm, uh, Psalm, Psalm 2 declares, Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in his spirit is no deceit. Psalm 103, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has removed, God has removed our transgressions from us. Friends, there is no, there is zero limitation or qualification to Christ's forgiveness. He just gives mercy on top of mercy, grace on top of grace. He piles forgiveness on top of forgiveness. There is nothing here about keeping track of how much or how many times you have forgiven someone. There's nothing in God's word and in Christ about him keeping track how many times he has forgiven us and thus putting a limit and a number on how many times he will forgive us. And that's the same posture and practice of forgiveness that Jesus is calling us to. From the heart, from the inside out, forgiveness is what Christ calls us to. And from that, with that heart posture and attitude, then we must forgive and amidst our forgiveness exercise patience. I noted this as we read, servant two is asking servant one not to cancel his debt, not to cancel his debt as the king has done for him. He's just asking for patience, right? He's asking for time, the opportunity to, to gain the resources, to raise the money so that he can pay back his debt. But the servant can't or won't even grant that. So we must see that forgiveness must start from a place of patience, right? We have been shown two immeasurably great things by our God, grace and mercy. Grace, what that is, is the patience of God that even though we keep sinning, that even though we keep messing up, even though we keep falling short of the glory of God, he keeps allowing us to be in relationship with him and out of that relationship to receive his mercy. His mercy, which handles the consequences of our sin, the consequences of our rebellion against God. Right, We must be people who live in grace, think of patience, and we must be people who live out mercy, think of lives of forgiveness. We must give, especially our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and in the church. We must give them the chance to do the right thing. We must give them the chance to do the right thing or the wrong thing. Again, no matter whether or not they do the right thing or the wrong thing. We must be willing. We must have a posture and then a practice of forgiveness and mercy, of grace upon grace, of mercy upon mercy. And then finally, and, and, and we'll close with this, we must forgive without keeping record, records, without keeping track of how many times we forgive. So often when we get forgiveness, I'll use air quotes here, when we get forgiveness right, so even when we forgive, we, we make sure that the person that we are forgiven knows that we are forgiving them, right? right? The slate between us is, is by no means wiped clean. But that's not how God works, friends. Think back to the parable of the talents in Matthew 25 that we looked at again a few weeks ago and that we spoke about at the beginning of our time together. 
Remember, with what God has given each of us is the ability and the opportunity to taste and see how truly good God is. To taste of the fullness of his joy. And that, that measure of forgiveness is what we are called to show as well. Again, we are all on the same level footing as believers. We are all as Christians, as followers of Christ, have the same standing, right? The old, the old saying that the ground around the cross, that the ground that sinners around the cross stand upon, it is totally and perfectly level ground. We have all, each and every one of us, been forgiven much. And what Christ calls of our lives, what Christ calls of our face, is that we too forgive much. So, remember the big idea of this passage, believer, follower of Christ, you have been forgiven much. And what the one who has forgiven you much, Jesus Christ calls from you, is that you also forgive much. I thank you for joining us today as we gather around God's word. We only have, I think it's four weeks, four parables uh, left as we study God's word together in this series. Uh, actually, next week, we're going to look at several parables that kind of relay, shorter parables that relay the same kingdom reality. Uh, so I'm excited for that. And I'll pray that you join us. And I'll pray until then that God blesses the rest of your day. We would welcome you to join us here Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock where we gather and worship at 5482 Old Philadelphia Pike. We also post all of our sermons and videos. We live stream our worship services at 9 o'clock. Everything can be found at our online home at pcchurch.online. We also have our YouTube and Facebook and Instagram channels. Uh, we'd love for you to be a part of it. Again, as I said at the beginning of the video, we exist to help you know and follow Jesus. So if there's a way that we can do that, please let us know in the comments or by email. You can email us at peckwayevents, all one word, all lowercase, at gmail.com. And we would love to help you and resource you as we are able to grow to know and follow the goodness of our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Until we meet again, until you join us here at 5482 Old Philadelphia Pike, may God bless the rest of your day.